It's the internet. You're busy. Let's do this. I'm Jeff Grubb. I write for gamesbeat.com. I do some stuff over at Giant Bomb. Uh, and this is video games from 30 years ago. Uh, I decided to uh, start looking into the past of video games a little bit more. Um, and I found that things have changed quite a lot, at least in terms of coverage. And yet uh, our anxieties as gamers have largely remained the same. So this is the May issue of Elect Electronic Gaming Monthly uh, from 1992. So that is 30 years ago. Uh, why the May issue? Well, the May issue, the issues usually come out a month ahead of time. So this would have been on the newsstands around April of 1992. Basically though, this is 30 years ago exactly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this magazine, take a look and see what gaming was like three decades ago. First thing, of course, is uh, there were a lot of ads uh, in, in video game magazines. It, it might seem um, obvious to point that out, but we live in a world where, you know, I write for a video game website. We don't have most of these companies. Well, a lot of these companies don't exist anymore, um, but a lot of our ads don't come from these companies. We don't make a lot of money from these companies anymore. At least as far as I understand it, there's a little bit of a firewall there. Um, but I know that like Capcom's not buying a lot of ad space on our website and even on the big websites, they're not doing a ton of that. And when they do, they're built for the web in a way that, you know, there's not a lot of like ad copy where um, you get whole paragraphs written about games. But of course this was just the way advertising worked back then with magazines, uh, kind of still slightly before uh, the internet earnestly got started. 1992 people were definitely on the internet, but um, it was not, it was definitely not in every American home at that point. Um, so you can see here, we got the, the table of contents, but I wanna go here and check it out. Uh, this editorial from the editor, Ed Simrad. Um, if you know anything about this era of EGM, it's definitely from a different time. Uh, it is before they sort of had their uh, maturity period where new editors came in and sort of gave them a, a sense of, you know, a, a sense of ethical responsibility to the reader. This was much more, a, a very much a, an enthusiast magazine written by enthusiasts where, you know, it was all about relationships and uh, all about trying to uh, be close with the people you were covering. There wasn't a lot of sense of trying to oh, protect the reader by uh, acting as a firewall between the reader and the publishers trying to get their money or something like that. It was all like, we all love games and uh, can we get the staff a bunch of free swag and then we'll cover your game. Um, it's definitely not like that anymore. Um, I, I know people still think it is, but that back then it really was. Anyway, anyway, the, the, this uh, this editorial, which you can never tell if it was actually written by Ed Simrad or not. I've heard stories that like, he didn't always write all this stuff, but uh, this uh, editorial was from 1992 and it was worried about, is the industry ready for the CD-ROM drive? Uh, we're not gonna go read this. We'll read some of these other articles in here, but this is basically just him saying, hey, it's kind of early, it's expensive. It came out in Japan, uh, the Sega CD did anyhow, and it was $380, or at least the equivalent of that in yen. And more importantly, it didn't have a lot of games. And basically all, the, all his concerns are accurate. Uh, he was right. The CD-ROM uh, drive was too early. We wouldn't really get it in earnest in, ter in terms of it succeeding in the industry until what, 95, 96 with the PlayStation and the Saturn. Uh, but yeah, it definitely took off then. In 90, 1992, um, most games coming out were just Genesis games, but with the CD audio uh, and he points that out. And, uh, and and yeah, it was it was too early, but it was the growing period. It was the, a painful period in terms of like figuring out what that technology can do and how to implement it. And once a system fully embraced it as its core media, the rest was history. Uh, but then that brings us to letters to the editor from gamers. So in 1992, the biggest game in the world probably was Street Fighter II. And so there's a lot of letters about that. Uh, in particular, people are asking, hey, should I get a Super Nintendo to get that full 16 meg cart? Now, back then people were upset, like editors at magazines were obsessed with the uh, size and storage of like how much, how many megs were on a cartridge uh, for a game. They, they took that as a big indicator of like how, how much money was going into the game. Uh, anyway, Street Fighter II being on a 16 megabyte cartridge, uh, could have been megabit, but 16 meg cart was a sign that that game was going to be this massive, uh, like true to form version of Street Fighter II for the home. And that was, that turned out to mostly be the case. Uh, but you have people asking the editor, oh, are we gonna get a special controller, stuff like that. Um, 
basically they said yeah we're getting a lot of letters about street fighter 2 the latest news is that capcom will make a joystick and this is um this is from the editor uh it will be called capcom's Cap competition joystick and it has been specifically designed for the snes or snes i don't know why they are stylizing ass or s dash ness i hate that i'm gonna just say super nintendo uh, for the Super Nintendo Street Fighter 2, although it will work on any Super Nintendo or Nintendo cart cartridge. The stick will have six action buttons, an eight-way joystick control, and three rapid-fire turbo buttons. I don't know, did this ever come out? I feel like, uh, I feel like I want to find out if this ever came out. Hang on, let's see here. Go Google, uh, Capcom Competition Joystick SNES. Um... Capcom Power Stick, was that, does that look like a Super Nintendo one? I can't tell. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, there you go, yeah. The Capcom Fighter Power Stick Controller. Uh, let's just click on the eBay listing. I guess I remember seeing this. Back then, like, fighting sticks for like a Super Nintendo, it just wasn't the time for that for like me. Uh, I would have gotten into that a little bit later. And these days, I'm, I'm shit at fighting games. So it doesn't matter. Um, okay. Uh, then there, you have people asking if the Super Nintendo CD-ROM that we've heard about at this point is going to still be coming. Super Nintendo um, obviously never got a CD-ROM drive, but a lot of people are asking about it. They believe CD-ROMs are the future. At least that's what they were hearing about at uh, CES before E3 actually happened. Uh, E3 wouldn't start until a few years later, what, 1995? So in 1992, there was still CES in January and then summer CES in, in uh, June. Eventually that would become E3. Um, and Nintendo would, we talked about that once there a little bit with people didn't have much to show. Um, obviously they were working on it with Sony. It was called the PlayStation. They broke up. Sony got mad and decided we're going to just make that ourselves. Um, a lot of people ask it about it though. Cause you know, the big thing happening in 1992 is Sega does have the CD-ROM drive coming out for the Genesis in Japan. People are getting excited about it. Should we be getting excited about this stuff? What's Nintendo going to have to, to, uh, respond because especially in 1992 by then it was clear that nintendo had the momentum uh and the genesis was struggling to keep up at that point before this point genesis was doing fine at this point it was starting to the the, the tides were turning and it was much more in favor of, of super nintendo people wanted to like people who were fans of nintendo wanted to sure they could rely on that and then people who were sega fans were like well once once the sega cd gets here everything's going to be better um course that didn't turn out uh let's see what let's see what the editor had to say to these people after nintendo released the info on their cd-rom they quickly went silent uh we, we went back into seclusion excuse me while very little else is known uh the, the latest word is that the super nintendo cd-rom will go the same route as sega's mega cd-rom you know the mega drive in japan and europe or whatever uh that is nintendo will bring back the old security chip and build into it uh the us cd-rom system of course yeah people were like wondering if they're gonna be able to easily pirate these cds back then um and also they're worried about like importing games from other regions but of course nintendo back then was never gonna let people do that that's what they're explaining here um here's one thing though that i, I just think is it's of course this is the the era for it but you know these days it does seem like fanboyism it's maybe worse than it's ever been. Uh, and it's not always the case. And especially if you're someone who doesn't specifically specifically cover one thing, you always hear from each individual group of fans that you're either too harsh on their on their system or you uh, favor, give favoritism to the other system or whatever. Uh, it happened back then. Here's a guy, uh, Michael Andrasik from Alberta, Canada says, too much Genesis coverage. Meanwhile, Ronnie Bowles from uh, Winston-Salem says, not enough Genesis coverage. Um, the editor says, ah, the joys of running a multi-format ma format magazine. It seems that you just can't please everybody all the time. As we stated in the March issue, Sega does not show a lot of new games at the January CES. We ran pictures of everything that was there and at the show. There just happened to be more Super Nintendo carts. The coverage uh, will probably reverse when we, when we cover June CES as Sega will bring out all their new softs and Mega CD discs. They called uh, games softs, as in software back then. Again, the, the terminology in the 90s video game magazines always gets me. Um, this is, I mean, God, this happens all the time still, where people just assume that the coverage that they're reading um, was completely it formulated in a vacuum and therefore must only represent the biases of the people writing it and has nothing based on, like, the context of the wider industry. Uh, the, the best example of this is in recent years, Game Pass gets a lot of coverage. Why? Because it's new and different. 
and uh, what has Sony's uh, strategy been this generation sp specifically? Well, Sony's gener uh, strategy is do more of the same, inherently less exciting to write about. So people give more ink to Game Pass. And then people assume that means people have a favoritism towards Game Pass when really we have a favoritism towards novelty. It's called the news as in new. And uh, that's just how it works. And, you know, that's that's what happens when, you know, one company shows more games than the other company. You end up writing about more of those games. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, of course, people worried about, uh, here, here's a fun one. Super Nintendo games for $80 each. I do believe the Street Fighter 2, uh, copy was $80 when it was coming out. Um, games got very expensive on those cartridges. That cartridge medium, uh, media was, uh, you know, as you were adding more storage, it was just more hardware going onto a circuit board and you had to pay for that. And like, think about games that had the Super FX graphics chip. And that was a graphics chip built onto a game that then hooked into your Super Nintendo, you're basically buying like a small little mini computer to plug in your system to play a, a you know, plug into it with something else that is also a computer. Wild times. Uh, they were gonna make CES open to the public. I actually have no idea how that turned out. He has a lot to say here, but I actually, um, it seems, feels like another topic. Um, and then, yeah, the mega CD, too expensive. I think history probably proved this right. Uh, this uh, Andre from uh, King Shell St. Croix. Uh, so the Sega CD-ROM was definitely very expensive and probably was um, one of the major reasons it was never going to take off because people were afraid to spend a lot of money uh, on developing software for it because very few people were going to have it. All right. Again, uh, lots of lots of copy in the ads. Uh, the only game to make the PGA Tour cut. Oh, this, is, this was also a big deal in 1992. Uh, video game companies were realizing that they could stand out from the crowd by getting the official licenses for um, sports leagues. So I think there's an NHL game in here for the Genesis that was like the only one that has like on the NHL roster or something like that. And this golf game has the exact same pitch. Pack your bags, you're going on tour, but make it your golf bags because it's PGA Tour Golf, the only game that lets you make the rounds with guys named Fuzzy, the Walrus, Hubie, and Fred. In some, 60 of the best players ever to swing a club. No matter how you slice it, this is the most realistic Genesis golf game ever. I like how they uh, specify most realistic Genesis golf games. Because Lynx for the PC kicks this game's ass. Uh, and then we get to the review crew, which one of the major reasons I wanted to come back here is... Um, you guys have it pretty good these days. If you want to make a purchasing decision without ever playing a game which, you know, you don't always even have to do because you could demo the game yourself or something. Or, But you have so many options. You could watch people play on Twitch, which I think is a great solution. Uh, you can listen to people talk on podcasts, another very good solution to at least know whether or not, if you hear other people get excited and you start listening closely, maybe you f figure out, oh, I am excited to at least try this. Back then, this is what we had. We had this and renting games and our friends, and our friends were on, weren't reliable. Renting games was like a special treat that you had to talk your parents into. Um, if you were a kid and then, uh, and then you had the reviews and I, I always read the reviews, but these things aren't very helpful. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. Let, let's just, let's read one. Let's see here. Uh, let's pick, um, let's look at a game that kind of got good ratings. Uh, let's, I think it was, uh, the Batman for, yeah, there we go. A Game Boy, uh, Game Boy game, Batman Return of the Joker. Uh, here is the, like the top text, which explains what the game is. The popular NES title is now available on the Game Boy. You control the Dark Knight on a mission to rid Gotham City of the Joker's evil henchmen. You must fight through five stages in an attempt to reach the Joker before he could take over Gotham City. Use various weapons that you pick up along the way, such as batarangs and the bat rope. The Joker must be stopped, and Batman is just the guy to do it. Now, I think in terms of setting up what the game is, they did a lot and very little. And they, they got very good at this stuff. They were pretty good at that. Um, but if you want more information about, like the specifics of the game, you're out of luck. I mean, this is what you get from the re reviews. Um, I I love the original Batman card on Game Boy, and while the sequel is not much of a stretch beyond the territory laid down in the first entry, it is still an enjoyable uh, and intense piece of video gaming. Great graphics complement the action as well as equally as impressive sounds and musical scores, a Game Boy winner. So, I mean, what did we find out there? Um, it plays like the last game. It has good graphics. It has good sound. Uh, it doesn't go much beyond the first game. Again, they're doing a lot with a little, but it, it is very little. Uh, now, it, there was four reviews for each game, of course, so which is like back then they did it just like Famitsu. Um, now, this is what a spectacular Game Boy card is like. It has controllable action, 
surprisingly good graphics, excellent gameplay, and a good license behind it. I mean, so again, we are controllable action. I don't know what that means. It's a video game. Hopefully it has controllable action. Uh, and now we're repeating information. Surprisingly good at graphics, excellent gameplay, and a good license behind it. So it's a license that's good, and this person's... A, I mean, they had to do a lot and very little. They had to, like, make it punchy, but you weren't getting... You were never getting the nitty-gritty. Um, let's see, what else? The good game... The good mu the good game music is an added plus. The, 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 excuse me. The difficulty curve starts off easy and gets harder at a reasonable rate. Don't miss this super cart. They love they love calling uh, games carts back then. Um, yeah, I mean all the reviews are like this. It's it's helpful to a point. Basically, you're getting uh, slightly longer versions of thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, and if that was good enough for you, and it was kind of good enough for us back then, it, it it worked to a certain extent. But these days, I mean, there's numerous like dozens of detailed reviews and those are just the ones like written and posted to like metacritic or open critic if you want to go get like the deep dives there are youtubers who are like dedicated to certain game genres that know how to like de de like deconstruct the games down to their very core and break down every minute detail and there's people out there doing those reviews for brand new games and uh it's just a completely different world we've come so far in terms of like the service journalism side of stuff of like trying to figure out what a game is, what it does well, how, how, how it works and understanding all this, we've come, it's, it's light years beyond where we were 30 years ago, as we should be, but uh, yeah, still. Okay, this is Gaming Gossip, which of course is written by Quarterman, uh, sort of a, 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 a name that was adopted by multiple different people writing the news section for EGM over the years. Uh, but Quarter, Quarterman in, in, the, in the fiction is this uh, spy who gets all this information from all these different companies. Um, the big rumor this month was um, that they were going to start packing in Street Fighter 2 with the Super Nintendo. And I don't know if they ever did that. So let's look that up. Super Nintendo with... Actually, you know what? That's going to use Bing because I'm using Edge because I'm a pervert. Um, Google.com. Super Nintendo with Street Fighter 2 packed in... Yeah, look at that. At least that's uh, th that looks like a Europe one or maybe a J Japanese one. I mean, it's a Super Nintendo, so it'd be a uh, Europe one uh, because look at that. Or is that the top loader? Or I'm sorry, the uh, the second revision. No, that's a, that's a Super Famicom design, which they had in Europe. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, look at that. Okay, here, here, we see right here. Les Jeux, Adapter Satur, Un Cable Video RVB, Un Manette de Jeux Super Nintendo. Le console de base Super Nintendo. So, yeah, okay, obviously this was in France, I think. I think that's French. God. Um, so, yeah, that did happen. And this was Street Fighter II Turbo. So, this is a later version. Uh, let's see if there was one before that. You know, we'll just go to images. I'm sure there'll be images of it if it existed. Uh, Street Fighter II. Yeah, look, it, looks, it, seems like it probably just happened in certain territories. Makes a lot of sense. One of the reasons uh, Nintendo wanted to do this, according to Quarterman, is... Let's see. Let's go back here. Um, word on the street is that Nintendo and Capcom are rumored to be inking a deal that will bring Street Fighter 2, the 16 meg monstrosity, into Super NES system boxes as the pack end. The Q-Man could dig up few details on how this rumored plan would actually work, but those in the know tell yours truly that giving Super Mario the heave-ho in favor of the World Warriors was a compromise between the Big N and Capcom to maintain the cart's $80 suggested retail price. More on this news item later in Related... Uh, Street Fighter 2 news, Capcom has flip-flopped on the idea of offering a special controller specifically made for the game. While they originally had intended to provide the special controller as part of the game, the folks at Capcom scrapped that idea, but will instead be bringing out a Street Fighter 2 controller separately. That would have been wild to, like, have the game and you have to buy it with the, with the special controller. Now, obviously, that's the better way to play it, but you could just map some buttons to the shoulder buttons and play it with the Super Nintendo controller. That totally was, I mean, that's how I played it. Wild times. Uh, the other rumors aren't uh, nearly as interesting. Uh, well, there's this one that I don't know if... The rumors back then, uh, you know, it's a magazine. They weren't getting immediate feedback, and it was very hard to debunk these things. I've always heard that Quarterman occasionally, like, elaborated and sort of uh, took information and did some tall tales and did some guessing and stuff like that and some wishful thinking. 
Um, like, I have no idea what to file this under, but I don't know if this ever really happened. Uh, looks like the whiz heads at Nintendo have struck again. I don't think that's a term of endearment. Uh, the gaming Goliath is now rumored to be shipping a new development system called the Quad, which will enable developers to display graphics and generate sounds light years ahead of anything we've seen before. No word on when the Super NES, when the Super NES Quad games will start hitting, but don't look for anything before next year. Look for Comerica to breathe to breath new life into your existing 8-bit Nintendo console sometime later this year. Uh, through a new breakthrough in 8-bit cartridge ingenuity called the Aladdin Project, we will soon be blessed with a concept that will re revolutionize the way games will be sold and purchased. Look for Aladdin to work his magic sometime in the second half of this year. I googled some of this before I started recording. Couldn't find much information on it, but I might just be looking in the wrong places. I mean, this stuff, again, before most people are on the internet, so maybe there's just not a lot of information out there about this that's available online. I suppose I could like try to scour some other video game magazines for any information about this or ask some game developers who were working at the time uh, if any of this rings a bell. But for the most part, I, 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 the hunch I get here is this stuff was just probably uh, someone getting their, their signals mixed up and maybe going a bit further with the information that they had uh, to just fill out inches in a magazine. Ooh. Man, 1990s ad. Uh, this is just, yeah, in your face. Uh, this is you with your Super Nintendo. This is you with your Super Nintendo and the ASCII pad. Lots of um, weird controllers back then, but you could like set turbo, of course. Yep. Uh, clean up debris before the storm left behind. This was a, man, Desert Strike. They were just straight up going for like Desert Storm vibes, weren't they? In 1993, Desert Storm would have been what, 1991? Um... Here's an interesting one. Behind the screens at JVC of Japan, the making of the Wonder Mega. JVC is a Japanese uh, consumer electronics company. Um, this was, like, you remember, you remember the GameCube Q from Panasonic? This is kind of a similar idea from J JVC. I, you probably are familiar with the Wonder Mega if you're someone who pays attention to old hardware. Uh, but this is a super system, and it includes a Genesis and the Sega CD into one system. Uh, before the Sega CD ever even came out, in uh, the US, they were already talking about this. It was the equivalent of $620, so very expensive. Not a lot of people got these things, but um, it was definitely trying to uh, establish like a, a way for someone to like go out and just buy everything in one. Um, and there was at least some kinds of systems were pretty popular throughout the 90s, and popular from electronics companies, not popular with, with consumers. The first games of Wonder Mega, packed the, with the Wonder Mega, is a disc containing four games. Ooh, Flicky. I like Flicky. Uh, Paddle Fighter, uh, Pyramid Magic, and Quiz Scramble. And four karaoke programs with CD graphics. Sounds great. Uh, and then we get to the previews. And there's a lot of previews about new games coming up pretty soon. Uh, Adventure Island 3 for the NES. NES games still coming out in 1992, absolutely. Um... Uh, Parodius, uh, Parodius, maybe? Gargoyle's Quest, actually a pretty good game. Uh, Capcom has been looking, or has been making progress on the new NES version of their Game Boy cart. The most recent version that we played looked good with some of the action slash battle scenes in a side view perspective, and the quest portion in a top down view. Watch for this version later this year as it is coming to our NES. Yeah, I guess it's still, like 1992 still would have been like, yeah, I mean, while Super Nintendo was clearly like hitting its stride uh, in terms of getting people excited, um, NES hadn't gone anywhere yet. Um, although it was like, what at that point it was getting close to being uh, nine years old or something like that from its Japanese release. So yeah, successful system. Uh, I will say, uh, in terms of previews, uh, th things actually haven't changed that much. What do you say about a game you haven't played yet? You have to play a game to know if it's worth anything to anybody. And occasionally you get to do that with some games. You play it early, uh, you go hands-on. I mean, that's what I did a bunch at E3 and I've done that at other trade shows and stuff like that and and uh, consumer shows like PAX. Um, but it, it's still, even then it's like, I, I'm, I am then relaying my experience to you in a non-review way. So what am I really saying here? Not much. And really you could see, there's not much to say. It's better just to fill up pages with stuff so you can have, run more ads. Because uh, the rule was for every page of content, there was going to be a page of ads. That's how it worked. And if there were fewer ads one month, they would just write fewer content. But if they had, if they sold, you know, a hundred pages worth of ads, they had to have a hundred pages worth of content. 
So that would keep them very busy and they would just start filling up these pages with bullshit and a lot of screenshots. Screenshots were very important to fill out uh, the magazine. Um, God, then, then, then you get, as you get closer to the, to the back of a magazine though, it always kind of did turn into this stuff. Um, was this die, die, like you could just like, this is probably like an import thing. Yeah, like importing games, I think, from other territories. Yeah, PC Engine and um, yeah, Mega CD and your Neo Geo. And yeah, had like fill out a form and I would tell them what you want and they would send it to you. I never did that. Uh, not, not, not from a magazine anyhow. Eventually I would import stuff from Japan online. That made more sense to me for some reason. Oh, yeah, the tricks uh, back when we had codes in games. So uh, The Legend of the Mystical Ninja for Super Nintendo. Uh, to get to uh, like Zone 1. Yeah, they're like because this is like some games didn't have battery backup. So you'd have to use a code system to like jump through different parts of the game. And uh, like Punch-Out had that. So a lot of games still had that back, even on the Super Nintendo. Because battery backup was, you know, you had to pay for the battery and it added cost. Um, ooh, Joe, Joe and Mac, uh, hidden, hidden levels in level eight of Joe and Mac. There's a red egg. I'm going to say this cause Joe and Mac is on the switch right now. So here you go. In level eight of Joe and Mac, there is a red egg in the middle of the level. Kill all of the small dinosaurs before you crack the egg and you will be flown to a hidden bonus level in which you can power up your weapon and collect the key to get you in the blue dots on the map. Also in level nine, there will be a red egg in the beginning of the level. Crack it and you'll be taken to another hidden level. There you go. Ooh, Sim City for Super Nintendo. I, that should be on the Switch. I can't believe it's still not. Um, so yeah, lots of codes. Still lots of ads. Um, God, the, the contraptions for the Game Boy. Uh, keeping it portable was tough until now. And you got to look at that kid with that giant carrying case. Oh, Jesus. Um, man, lots. Of that. I don't know. Old ads are good, though, for the most part. I still mostly like looking at these things. And they bright and colorful. All the text. I mean, who was going to read all the text? Kids weren't. Um, I don't. I mean, I very rarely would like read something like this for Star Odyssey for the Genesis. I was looking at the, the screenshots and the box art and the design of the ad. Uh, but you know, copy editors at uh, or copywriters at, at ad firms had to get paid too. Uh, a futuristic sci-fi RPG. Cast yourself into the world of space adventure with a sizzling new role-playing game. Star Odyssey takes place millions of light years ahead of our own world in a galaxy far away. After being placed into a life capsule as an infant, as an infant, oh, so he's Clark Kent. Uh, you have emerged as a gallant warrior. Fair enough. I mean, that's how gallant warriors are made. I'm not, I'm not going to finish this. I never played Star Odyssey. Is that what it was? Star Odyssey, yeah. Uh, here's one way to take Sonic the Hedgehog wherever you go. And here's another two-page worth of ads for a Game Gear commercial ad. Um, yeah, and again, like, as, as you get to the end of the magazine, you could tell that they're just kind of filling out, filling out pages just with content as best they can. Um, Rival Turf. Uh, this was the one that was, like, the, a bad Streets of Rage knockoff, right? Rival Turf? I think so. And then, yeah, Chips and Bits. Let's see. What is, uh, is this, like, just telling you, like, okay, yeah, so if you want to buy these games... You would look at this thing and then you would call, yeah, reader service card. You would call this number and then you would try to order these games, I guess, I suppose. Yeah, Chips and Bits, P.O. Box 234, Rochester, Vermont. Uh, Genie keywords, chips. Huh, okay. Oh, oh, and I, I love these, uh, these previews, uh, how they have the fact file. And they tell us, okay, here's the manufacturer or the publisher or whatever, what system it's coming out. So the machine was Nintendo, but then difficulty, like for a preview, you had to like, I don't know, were they just trusting the publisher? The publishers were saying, I guess we're going for a moderate difficulty. What, what, that, what does that mean? And it says when it's available, a uh, cartridge size, because uh, they, again, they obsess with cart size, number of levels. This is the kind of stuff that when I was starting writing uh, was, a, was a meme, it was a joke. Uh, where it's like the bad writers, the bad reporters at a video game event where like, let's say you go to um, the Call of Duty event and you'd be there. The person we'd be making fun of is the person be like, and how many guns are in the game? Okay, and how many levels? Like, cause I mean, that way it was like, that's Bush League shit at that point. Like no one, no one actually cared. We were trying to get more uh, of a human response from these companies to like talk about their game in a more meaningful way. Um, but back then, like th that's where this stuff came from. It was like, you said how many levels, the size of the cartridge, like how many megs, um, you know, what, what your genre was. 
and then I guess ninety five percent complete. I mean, what I mean, we were we grew up on these very like graphical representations of this data like this. Um, I like like some of them like this one. It says uh, Firehawk difficulty is average, which is different than moderate. So this is moderate. This is average. It, it was meaningless. It was meaningless. It was just bright graphics filling out a screen or filling out a page. Excuse me. Uh, Kid Chameleon, uh, never a good game. Over 1,800 screens. What, is, what do you think that means right there? Right here. Over 1,800 screens. What do you think that means? Is that like... I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I played Kid Chameleon, but is it not a scroller? So like it doesn't like scroll. Maybe you like go off the screen and it gives you a new part of the level. And there's like 1,800 of those. I don't know if it's something to brag about. Uh, Splatterhouse 2. Uh, that's a good game. Coming to the Genesis from Namco. An 8 meg cart. So not quite a all out 16 meg cart. That probably means it won't cost $60 or $80, excuse me. Um, I don't know if I ever like recognized how expensive games were getting. I think mostly because if a game cost more than $50, my parents probably just weren't gonna buy it for me until it dropped in price. That's just kind of how it was. Like $50 was the max. Like that's how much, like a game costs $50. And they're like, that's right. Cause that's as much as we're gonna spit on you. Um, God, yeah. I mean, at a certain point, like a lot of the magazine just was, okay, here are games coming out soon. And thankfully for them, there was a lot coming out. There was a lot of systems. There was between the handhelds and the home consoles. There was a lot of stuff they could talk about. Marketplace. Kuma connector. The adapter that allows you to play Super Famicom cartridges on your Super NES. Um, Very cool. I, by the time I really started getting into video game magazines, which was a little bit after this, um, the, a lot of this uh, import stuff and the marketplace stuff had, at least I don't remember it. May, maybe it still happened, but I, it was not as a big uh, as big of a part of the magazine as I remember at that point. Um, although, video game magazines is definitely where I learned about Goku uh, because all the the the, the uh, envelope art that they would send into magazines and some magazines would print that stuff always had Goku on it. I'm like, what the, what the fuck is this? Eventually I found, uh, found out what Dragon Ball Z is and we were all good. Uh, oh, okay. Here's a good one. Uh, what was this game stuff? Here are the results from the Neo Geo beat the game Lord contest at winter CES. So Rick Nelson from Redding, California. I know my son and I will have a lot of good times with the Neo Geo gold system. So they must've won. I'm really happy that I won the Neo Geo gold system. I can't wait to play it. Good for you, Matthew Cutzel. That way, that's not that's not your dad, is it, Rick Nelson? Whatever. Uh, these are probably two separate winners. Uh, the grand prize winners are receiving the Neo Geo Gold System, Las Vegas, Nevada, and then Thor Ackerland. We should look up Thor Ackerland. See what he's doing these days. Game over. I'm trying to see like how did the magazine wrap up? Back at, like there was eventually that we got to a point where um, yeah, I think that's it. So Retro Mags. Thank you, Retro Mags, for uh. We're backing these up on archive.org where I read this. Uh, but by the end of, um, by, like a little bit later in the 90s, they would have like a, a fun last page. And apparently, nope, this is just, we'll just get these last big ads in here. So the, and honestly, in the back of the magazine, um, you know, it's easy to get to those pages. So these are probably pretty expensive ads. Uh, Sunsoft's Spy Hunter game, Super Spy Hunter, excuse me. Uh, Batman Return of the Joker for Game Boy. A uh, big ad, not right next to the very good review for the game. Uh, and The Addams Family, which is, a, you know, an okay game. Uh, so, yeah, th that was 30 years ago in EGM. Uh, I think we'll probably bring in some other magazines in the future, but uh, EGM in the early 90s is kind of the only magazine that, like, uh, I, I think is kind of worth going back to. Uh, soon we'll go back to, like, Game Fan, but I don't think Game Fan even started until a little bit uh, after this. Um, but we'll, we'll check out, like, I'll go to Game Pro and some other stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, tell me, you know, let me know. Do you like this? Was this fun? Was this worthy of your time? Um, I like doing this stuff. Well, let me know if it's okay if I do the digital version. Should I get the physical magazine? I think it's better. It's more readable if we do it this way. I had a lot of fun. I like going back and looking at this stuff. Um, maybe we could also do like 15 years ago. And t like magazines were still kind of a thing 15 years ago. Not very much though. They were starting to come to an end even that long ago. Uh, Jesus, that's messed up. So yeah, maybe we could do um, sort of a bookend, like 30 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe maybe 20 years ago would be even better. 
Um, maybe we could do one of those as well. But this was 30 years ago in games. Uh, the EGM here, uh, thank you so much to everybody who watched this long video. I didn't think I would go this long, 35 minutes just now. Thank you for watching. Until next time, take care of yourself, have a good one, and goodbye. Bye.